a day and say, now go do whatever you think is best. Nope. What God knows is for your life, what God knows is for his church, what God knows he wants done in the world, God always has a plan. But yet it all starts with this, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Yes. These words that Paul writes to the Corinthian church are the words that were shared by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 64, verse 4, but they were worded a little bit different. They say, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear. From the very beginning, God's everything of God's plan has not been known. Nor has I seen any God besides you. There's no other who acts for the one who waits for him. Again, the agnostic belief does not align with the word. <laughs> God is very knowable. He is always revealing. And God's always got a plan. He's never twiddling his thumbs wondering what he's going to do next. He doesn't have an idle time where he's going to sit back and just leave everything alone. He's always working. Isn't that what Jesus said? That, you know, they're, they're like, Jesus, you're exhausting us. Well, I work because I see my father work. And as long as he's working, it's time for me to work. So as long as we see God doing something, guess what? The church doesn't go idle. That's right. Oh, you missed a good chance to say amen. 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 Isaiah is speaking these words 70 years after Jeremiah said something very similar. In Jeremiah 29, 11, many of you have received it as a rhema word from God. For I know the thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now I want you to kind of catch this timeline. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, this is before Babylonian captivity. God is telling them because of their sin, because of their rebellion, there's going to be a Babylonian captivity. The, the king, the armies are going to come. They're going to take your best men. But I want you to know this is all going to be part of my plan. Israel, not you, but Israel. But I want you to know, in 70 years, my plan is you will return home. But it's going to take 70 years for some people to learn. It's going to take, I don't want to be those people. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I know the plans that I have for you, God says. That word that's used for thoughts is also, I know the purpose I've already got for you. God's not making up your purpose. He already wired you with the purpose. You just don't know it yet. But you will never know the purpose God has for you outside of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ever. You will always walk in circles. You will always be saying, I don't hear God speak. Until you submit to whatever the Holy Ghost wants for your life, you will never know the purpose God has for you. I know the thoughts. I know the plans. I know the purpose. That word is also used in scripture. The same Hebrew word in Jeremiah 29, 11 is I know the inventions that you need. The things that are not even invented, but you're going to need it. That is actually in scripture. The word invention. God also says through the same word used for I know the thoughts, the plans, the purpose, the invention. He says, I know the means that you need. I know the resources you're going to have to have. Even if God reveals the purpose, anytime God reveals the purpose, it's going to be bigger than you. But God also says, I'm going to reveal the plan that is beyond what you can see. I'm going to reveal the plan beyond what you've heard. I'm going to reveal the plan beyond where everything you know. Let me say this verse again. I has not seen nor ear heard. Come back. <laughs> I think that happened the last time we were out here. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You see, this is why we can trust a word that we have put in our heart many times. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who who love him. Amen. To those who God has called 
according to his purpose for you. And we know this. Why? Because God's not making it up. God knows everything that's going to happen. He knows every detail. He knows every every invention that needs to, to, to occur. He knows every resource you've got to have. Therefore, I know God will cause everything to work together. So the principle is this. For those who love God, every day is a good day. It may not look like a good day. Sometimes it don't feel like a good day. But as long as you are loving God, when you walk in His call, God's working His plan, He is going to work everything out for your good. That's a good day. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's a pretty uh, powerful word to think that God has something prepared for us. God has it in his hand, prepared to give it. It's not an issue of God, do you have something? God says, no, I've got something. Then why aren't you giving it? Because you're not ready. When you're ready, I just want you to know it's prepared. Put it this way. Food's prepared, but you ain't eating. But you're not ready. Ricky's ready. Ricky should have breakfast. No, no, no. I know, I know we're ready in the sense of, boy, it smells good. I've been smelling this thing since yesterday. It's ready. But I believe God says we're not ready because there's something we've got to do as a family first. About a year ago, I presented before this church, not an I, I'm not trying to emphasize the I, but I, but I shared a vision with this church that I believed that God wanted us to have a part-time children's director. It was also revealed, I shared it with the Trusted Stewardship team four years ago. The first response was not exactly... Hey, I see that. Let's jump into it. Some were like, that's possible. Some were, I don't know that I see that. So I continue to pray. Maybe I'm missing it. I'm not sure. We talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And God ends up turning our hearts to the young harvest, children, teenagers. I mean, God's blessed us with a lot of kids around here. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And he's blessed us with a lot of people who want to minister to him. But we said, God, would you give us? Listen, this is what I said. It wasn't, if God, if it's your will. I did not pray, God, if it's your will, would you give us a children's director? I did not pray. I never prayed that once. You know what I prayed? God, would you just give us a, a children's director? Because the point is, if he don't want to, he's not going to. But if I ask for it, isn't that the model in Scripture? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Nowhere does it say, ask God uh, if he's willing. In fact, the Bible actually says plenty of times when they go to Jesus for healing, they said, we know you're already willing. You already said you were willing. So would you just do it? So that was our prayer a year ago. And you joined me in that. The Trust and Stewardship team joined me in that because they started setting aside a budget. For that was supposed to take us 16 months, okay? 16 months to raise the funds for one year of a part-time salary for our children's director. And we cast that vision. We said we can get there faster if when you pray when, and you believe that's what God's going to do, you go ahead and sow in it too with your grace giving. And what was supposed to take 16 months, this church did as a family in nine months. Nine months. Amen. Amen. Now, since that time, we had the nine months, and everybody's like, okay, now that we got it, what are we doing? I said, well, now we start praying about the who. We start inviting people to apply. We came down to this. Let me shorten this up to this point. God, do you realize that the very Sunday we planted it in vision with the church was the very first Sunday that the Schiller family came to church? Isn't God good? God is good. 
moved here from California as a home. They traveled the states, the country, for an entire year asking God to prepare a place for them and open up a job, open up a location, and God planted them in Gallatin, Tennessee through the homeschool co-op. I meet Jessica, and Jessica walks into the church, and we're casting vision that God is either going to, one, raise up somebody, or he's going to bring one in. Look. If God can arrange for the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem, believe me, he can make yes. it so there's, yes. there's a children's director in the church. Yes. October 1st, we hired Jessica Schiller to be our kids' director. Amen? And I'm pumped because it's not just that, hey, we got a kids' director. I'm pumped because the whole journey has God's fingerprint all the way through it. The funding, the vision, the mission, the excitement, the timing, everything came to this point that we're like, Lord, I'd be afraid to stand against you. I'd be afraid to say I don't need one if I saw all God, everything God's already done. I don't want to get in his way. And I don't ever want to pray another prayer that goes in a different direction. So this is one first thing we're going to do as a church family at this point. Jessica, would you come up here? And I want to invite her husband, Doug, over here. Would you guys give them some love? God moved this couple again, this family from Tennessee, from California, traveled for a year, asking God to open a door, planted them in our neighborhood, and brought them into the Lakeside family. And long, by the way, long before we ever reached this season of hiring, they were already family in this church. So it's almost like, God, you raised, you not only brought one in, but you raised them up to lead. That this transition of starting and everything, she already has a good pulse of what's going on in our church. And she's not perfect. She doesn't have answers. She's not going to do it for us. She's just here to train, to equip, to resource, and to lead. Yeah, she's still going to do stuff. I need to have, have the ministers come up with me real quick. Come on, right from where you're at. I'm sorry I didn't give you a heads up. But wherever you're at, ministers, deacons, quick, 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 quick. Come on, everybody ain't going to stay forever. And I want you, from where you're at, just stretch forth your hand towards the shillers. And I want you to join me in praying. This is a time of dedication over this ministry. That God will bless Jessica with the vision. That God will bless the mission that is ahead for our children's ministry. And that God's going to continue to open these doors. Father, we join together lifting our hearts with great gratitude to the Lord for what you have done. God, I pray for Doug and for Jessica that, Lord, you will continue to lead them. You brought them into this church family. You located them here when two years ago, God, they were already saying, Lord, you have another place for us. You have another mission for us. And they packed up everything. And, and contrary to what anybody else ever told them about it's crazy to go out on the road like that. It's cr crazy to just leave everything that's familiar. But, your Lord, they trusted you, and you brought them to a home. You brought them to a ministry. Lord, you brought them to a vision that they're a part of. And we thank you for this family. We pray blessings over Jessica and the vision you give, Lord. God, may she surrender everything to you to follow with great joy. May she always be equipped, Lord, with other leaders who carry the joy and excitement for this young harvest. God, we pray for their children, Lord. Blessings upon them, upon Ailey. Ryan and Jayla, Jaina, God, the sacrifices these kids have made, may they see the finger of God, the hand of God upon their lives. That, Lord, even as the parents watch their children grow up, they see that this has been a place where God brought their children to use them, to grow them into their purpose and plan of God. Lord, we give glory and honor to you for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love you guys. I love you guys. Thank you, my brother. Amen. Come on, give him a bigger cheer than that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. When vision is given from God, the strength of the vision is always in the why, not in the understanding. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. 
The strength of, vi of the vision that God gives is not about do you understand everything about it. It's never about do you agree with it. The power of vision is always in the why. The reason why. So whenever God gives you vision for your life or vision for our church ministry, it's two things God gives vision in a why. The first why is always this. God gives vision for his glory. It's never going to change. God's vision for his glory is he gives you something that is about him and it's not about you. This is why so many people have prayed this prayer, but they get silence on the other end. God, just show me what I'm supposed to do. Just, just give me a purpose in my life. As if you need your life to have all the meaning. You lost. You started off with the wrong reason why. And when you start with the wrong reason why, you're going to end up with the wrong result. The reason why God gives vision is always for his glory. If it's not going to bring God glory that we have a Lakeside Kids director then we did the wrong thing. The wrong reason leads to the wrong result. So it's always God's vision that he gives for the reason of his glory, for the purpose of his glory. Second why that God gives vision is for the increase of the effectiveness in God's kingdom. If it's not going to grow the kingdom, if it's going to be about growing a church family, and we call that growing the kingdom, I don't think people always see that as the same thing. Because all they want to measure is how many people sit in a pew. And that's not the kingdom. The kingdom is how many people are getting outside the church and going to work. How many people are going out there to glorify the Lord in their workplace? We're about to shorten the message. Ricky. <laughs> God always gives vision for the purpose of increasing and the effectiveness of God's kingdom. Whether it's growing up leaders, or it's giving talents, or if it's blessing you with finance, God didn't do it for you. He did it for the kingdom. You know, we, all, we have 27 acres here on this campus. How many knew there were 27? How many did not know there were 27 acres that belonged to Lakeside? Who, who did not know? Just raise your hand. Real high. I want to know. Okay. Look. Oh, wow. We even got kids that are growing up here. We got 27 acres. If you mow this property, you know how much property there is. <laughs> and yet, some of you might be thinking, 27 acres. Oh, wow. I wouldn't have thought this was that big. It's because you can't see the rest of the acreage. All you see is eight. I said 27. Forgive me. My math's off. Eight acres we mow. 16 acres. 20, 24. We have 24 <laughs> acres. Sorry. I was, I was asking God to increase our territory right there. <laughs> Give us the woods. Give us the lake. Hey, give me time. <laughs> but that's not my prayer. I'm at invited. But we have 24 acres of property. That's supposed to belong to God in his kingdom. It's not for the luxury of lakeside family events. It's not so that we can simply say we've got all of this to ourselves. God says if I've given it, I want it. I'm going to use it. I've been reading an article that uh, about visionary leadership. I'm challenged by this. I've, I've even met with leaders. I've met with the Trust and Stewardship team. We had an impact night, a catalyst impact night with everybody who at that time who was, who's been appointed into ministry leadership. There are ministers, our deacons, the di directors of ministry, um, and even those who we count on an awful lot to, to help, help get the things moving in this church. So I said, I am challenged about who are visionary leaders and who are not visionary leaders. Because not everybody is a visionary leader. Let me explain. Brad Lominick in his book about the catalyst leader, he said these words. Listen, being a catalyst leader means you are working to identify, understand, 
and pursue God's unique call on your life with passion and patience. God desires for a sense of mission to burn within us, driving us forward. So let me explain. There are leaders that are good leaders. You can give them things to do and, and, and they get it done. That's a good leader. But there are catalyst leaders that are visionary that they not only see what needs to be done, they see what, what we can become and they begin to already model it. For example, catalysts are future focused. They're not just driven to accomplish something. They're always looking to the future, always seeking the Lord and where he wants to take them next. They are dreamers for sure. They're dreamers, but they are dreamers of the possibilities and the opportunities, and they're willing to start modeling the behavior that goes in that direction. They see a need, need for change. They see an opportunity for growth. They see an opportunity for God's kingdom. And they lead that change by casting vision. You know how you cast vision? It is certainly by your example. But you cast vision... By just talking about it. What could be. And when you talk about it enough, sooner or later, especially when it's time to pray, you start saying what should be. You go from what could be to what should be. And then they're the same ones that say what will be. They're the ones that are there when it says it is. Catalysts always aim to do all for the glory of God. A visionary leader, you're surrounded with several. There are many in this church that are visionary leaders. And, and, and anybody who's been here at the Lakeside Church for a good number of years, um, they are visionary leaders because, you see, Lakeside Church has not always sat here on this hill. They used to be in a tiny white building called Bostick Chapel. I never know if I'm saying that right. But, but, well, see, y'all say it with a southern accent, so I don't know if I'm saying ball stick or ball stick or what. Ball stick. Okay, you did not help. <laughs> you just left me confused. Okay, so Boston Chapel, here it's still a, a church building that is still up. I mean, it exists. But at some point, somebody said, you know what we could do, should do, will do? You're sitting with people who, who went through those conversations. They went through those discussions, and they heard people say, that'll never happen. They heard people say, we shouldn't, and I won't. And then God said, ask me. And they did. And you end up with a beautiful chapel. Education wings, offices. Another pastor comes in, visionary leader, a parsonage. Another pastor comes in, a visionary leader, Family Life Center. Another pastor comes in, visionary leader. And by the way, visionary leaders attract visionary leaders. It doesn't hinge on one. They attract other visionary leaders because nobody likes to just sit there. No visionary leader will just sit there. But even this pavilion, what we the, the whole campus happened because somebody had a should moment. Or a could moment, then a should moment, to a will do moment. And they worship here today. John Maxwell suggests that a visionary leader is one who, far, who sees farther than others see. They see more than others see. And they see before others see. I know a manager is still a leader, but a manager is the person who just manages what they see. But a visionary leader leads to what others can't see. Now, the reason I wanted to really set this up is because we are, today, our tailgate celebration is going, it is a part of not only where, what you see here, but it's, it's a part of what you haven't seen. See, there are two visionary leaders who fought the fight. They, run the, they ran the race, and they have won. Yes, God. They've gone before us, but they didn't leave us with nothing. They left us with a vision. Their heart still is as strong as it was when you know, knew them. Their passion has grown more than you could ever imagine. Deacon Richie Wicks left us two, about two and a half years ago, January 1st 
of 2019, he went home. Not even two months ago. And the main reason why we have moved this tailgate Sunday into October. But Madison Alexander got her victory done. And in bringing this up, I'm not, I'm not wanting to take us to a somber moment. We're not here to remember. You know, there's a difference between a memorial. No, let me just tell you what a memorial is for. A memorial is only there so that you can remember somebody or remember an event. That's why you do a memorial. But today we're going to dedicate two pieces of, of our land, two parts of our property, two areas of our ministry in the mindset of vision, not in remembrance. We're going to dedicate in prayer right here in just a couple of minutes. Troy, can you come here? Would you come? Troy is Madison's husband. He's got one of their babies with him. The other one's out there somewhere. Leslie's out there. Yeah, she's hanging over there. We've got his grandchildren are out there. Gina, would you come up here and represent your family? Gina is Richie's wife. Both of these, while they've been walking through the valley, God has been making them warriors. All right? Listen, listen. I'm not trying to be somber. I just want you to remember, and I want you to know that God blessed this church with a visionary leadership that I am very committed to leading forward with vision, not in casting a remembrance of what used to be or what somebody once thought. The reason we have trails up on 16 acres of property is specifically because I sat with Richie Wicks and he said, God gave us 16 acres up there. What are we doing with it for God's glory? I said, I don't know. What do you think we should do with it? We took, after we logged that property, we, they, they, it had left so many paths for us to go on the trails. And we went up on there, Richie, our deacons, we had several men. We had a men's breakfast that morning, and after the men's breakfast, we took a walk. Walking through the woods. And Richie was all about trails. We could do four-wheelers, side-by-sides. There's a flat spot for teaching kids archery. Of course, Richie knew those woods because Richie is hunted in those woods. He's bow hunted. But when he started planting that, I remember my son and I were up there one, one of these winters, and he's helping me to get rid of logs and clear pathways. And, and, and I said, one day we're going to see trails here. And Jordan's like, for what? I said, for hiking. We're going to get a four-wheeler. He said, well, can we clear them after we get the four-wheeler? <laughs> you remember? I said, no, that's not how it works. Vision says we work for what is to become, and then God will provide the four-wheeler when it's time. So he's going out there clearing thorn stuff out of the way. We've had some resources. We've seen several of you coming and start taking care of some trails. But this is the official day that we're going to open this up. We've used them. We've been clearing them. We've been making them wider. But this is we're opening it up for Lakeside Ministries, Youth Ministries, Kids Ministries. And we're going to open it up to the community. I'm not about telling the community this is ours. We're not going to give you a place. We're going to open it up to New Vision Outdoors, their ministries. We're going to open it up to others. I am not trying. We are insured. Don't worry. Whatever you guys got going through your mind. Some of you already looking at me like, don't, don't do that. I'm just telling you. Visionary leadership says this is for the glory of God. I don't know how many months ago it was that Troy and Madison served on a team with many of you to take this campus area right here and to make it more effective, open it up for, for all ages, not only for kids to have playgrounds, but to have a quality playground. An area where our youth and our children and our families can get out and play, kick balls without them always going in the woods. We wanted to do something that the kids loved, a gaga pit. All of that discussion, part of that team was Troy and Madison Alexander, visionary leadership of what could be, should be, and they led the way to what will be. So over here, we're doing this in, in vision of, not memory, not honor of. We're not trying to keep somebody, somebody remembered. We're taking 
the vision that they had, and we continue to grow the kingdom just as God wanted it to be done. Now, you and I both know the character of Richie Wicks and Madison Alexander. They would never, ever let me do what I'm about to do. But it's only by the permission of Gina and Troy that I am uh, going to lead in this direction. So out there at this point, at this time, until I hear differently from Gina, that she's going to talk to her family more about it. But that's going to be from here on out. Listen, listen to me until you know what I'm talking about. That is Richie's Ridge. All right, that's going to be Richie's Ridge. Is that money floating? Yep. <laughs> Just keep bringing it. <laughs> Sorry. You for real, bro? Okay. Richie's rich. That out there is Madison's family flavor. Okay? No. It's, it's, I don't I don't have anything to give them to commemorate. I, I felt like printing something out with those words is just not enough. Okay? And it, it, it's not to insult them that I'm not giving them anything. But part of it's just because we're gonna do it right. We're going to make something. You know, I look over here. This pavilion was in memory of Grover H. Brown from 1936 to 1999. And I know several of you know them, know that family. And it's a good family. And, and actually, I think this fireplace is here because of that family. Yes, <laughs> Thank the Lord. They built it. Yeah. And, and it is in honor of them. But I'm not wanting to just do it on them. I want to do a vision. And, because both places are not everything they should be. Okay? This playground's got to grow more. We don't have the equipment. We have to raise the money at some point. Isaac will tell you one way you can do that today. <laughs> but that, that up there on the hill, hill, there's still more we can do. When people come up there, my hope is, and I've only shared this as an idea with, with uh, Gina and Isaac, my hope is that we can put scriptures, Richie's favorite scriptures from his Bible, up there so that people are getting scriptures while they're walking. And put some benches up there that are adequate so that people, while they're walking, even if they just need a break, they got a place to sit. Right. And we can offer this to our community for strength. All right. It's going to take. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do what I want. I'm gonna, I'm, you know how I said, was that money that just flew? Um, and I know this is an extreme sacrifice, but Troy, the check that flew over there was Troy's. And he, bought, he said I can do. He said I can do what I want, so I'm gonna do this. But 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 I know he's one of the most humble men. But this check is for three thousand dollars for the playground. says that this man wants to see this for the glory of God. It's not just a place for his children to grow up and your children to grow up. It's a place for God to bless and love kids and for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when you know that a vision is beyond yourself, you start saying, God, will you use me to make a difference for the kingdom, for your glory? And that causes you to invest time that's when you really believe a vision, by the way, when you put the time into it. You believe a vision when you put the finances toward it. And you'll believe a vision, people will know you believe the vision when you sweat for it. Amen? Why don't you stretch your hands toward this couple right here. Even for even the leaders, ministers, just right where you're at. Oh, I'm so sorry, Leslie. Their only representation. Well, I just hope you get my heart right in the right way. 
I really do. Lord, move our church forward. That even as we pray, it doesn't matter if it's only been two months, if it's been two years, many of you have lost a loved one 10, 20, 30 years ago, and it's still very raw. You never, you, it never gets to a point where, oh, it's nothing. You have wept because you love them, but you weep because you also are empathetic. You know what they what they still go through. And we're going to pray strength over them that when they're also out there on the ridge, by the way, Gina's going up on the ridge, Isaac's going up on the ridge, they've got a side-by-side -side over here. Maybe you, you think, I can't walk it, they're going to take you up there. And you're going to feel the love and peace of God. Ricky's also got his tractor over there, I've just not seen it. With a hay ride, you can get on it. They're going up there. There's no reason why you should not yeah. to see what God is doing up there. Yeah. Because of visionary leadership. Lord, and get out here and play you, because of visionary leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? All right, stretch forth your hands. Let's pray. You, Can you give them a good shooter? The last thing I just want to share with you before, before we're done, and I, I really appreciate that you've given this much time already. But it's just so that I can tell you that I think God is making something plain. You see, visionary leaders are dreamers who have a plan. And the reason I can say that confidently is because that's who God is. God always speaks something that he also carries a plan for. Isaiah 46.10 tells us that God declared the very end from the beginning. He said, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying... My plan will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God was that way from the very beginning. So, so whatever COVID did to your mind and thinking, and you're scared about tomorrow, or you're wondering when it's going to end, God knows. You wonder how this is all going to play out, God already knows. I'm not worried, as long as he's on the throne. He's always had a plan. Psalm 37, 23, we, we, we believe this promise. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in that man's ways. God always gives a plan. Psalm 32 and 8, God said himself, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. You see, vision is a very powerful thing when God gives it, because not only does he have the vision for what will be, what he desires, but he's also got a plan to reveal along the way. So, taking a step about potential visions. Met with all the leaders, and I shared three things heavy on my heart. We talked about the need for new restrooms. In fact, I mentioned that in a vision message on, on one of our Sunday mornings. I said, we, we will be getting restrooms. And that Sunday... Um, that offering, we ended up having people give me offerings for restrooms. I'm like, well, cool. They already believe it. I just don't know when. I, I really didn't know when we would start that yet. We need to put restrooms that are accessible, easily accessible for everybody because of the kid. Our restrooms right now sit in the kids' zone, so they, you have to see it. But we also have talked about the parking lot needing to be redone. 
that's fallen apart, that's a heavy price. Maybe that's not vision, but it's definitely a need. And then I have asked the church for the last two plus years. Let's be praying about connecting the Family Life Center and the church building. Right now it's an overhead. It's very convenient. It's very useful. But should we connect it, it would create space. I have some trust and stewardship team to be praying with me about a one-year, three-year, five-year five year vision. But where I struggled most was I didn't know which one to go to first. Didn't know what order they should be done in. Plus, hey, I don't even know how we're going to pay for any of it. Truthfully, we're not there. As I stand right here, there, none of this is even financially feasible. But yet the scripture tells me, write the vision and make it plain. Put it on tablets that he may run who reads it. So I'm going to make it plain. I'm going to ask that you be understanding that I do not feel right now is the time to do restrooms. I, I am asking God, I'm not asking God, would you help us do restrooms? My prayer, and I'm inviting you to join me in doing this. My prayer is, God, would you just close in the overhang and connect those two buildings to give us more kingdom ministry work? That's my prayer. It sounds just like that. God, would you just close it in? You reveal your plan. You give us the provisions. But I'm not asking you to just... Show us if it's what we want. I'm asking you to do it. And I'm asking you to provide. Now, as I tell you that, I know opinions are everywhere. I know there's some that have voiced over the last two years. I think that could be good. I know that there's some good-hearted, faithful people, givers, who really are concerned if we do it. But the thing is, we've talked for two years, and the only thing God's brought me to is, ask me what you want. And I'm say, I'm just telling you right here, God, I want to close it in. And I want to make a new drop-off spot in case of inclement weather. I'm not, I'm not trying to say we don't, wouldn't find that convenient, but I'm, I'm not about overhangs and drop-offs. I'm about people and ministering in the kingdom and fellowship and uh, you can talk to me but I'm going to ask you are you willing to pray with me? Because if you're afraid God's going to do it you're not visionary. Uh, you may be visionary about some things but just pray and let God answer. That's probably what it comes down to. If God says no, he'll tell us no. He's big enough. He can do that. But if God says yes, then I don't want to get in his way. Amen? Go. Everybody look this way. I don't want you to hang your head. I want you to realize that there is a New Testament way that God gets things done. So pastor... Why would we put that before restrooms? Because in order to do the restrooms, what we have learned is that it will cost us $50,000 to put in restrooms. And you have to renovate other rooms in order for there to be an office. Because if you take the pastor's office and you turn them into bathrooms, and they wouldn't even be the size of the bathrooms we have in the family life center. So, should we close that in? As I'm praying, God, will you close that in? We will end up connecting to the restrooms that are in the Family Life Center. And if God wants us to have new restrooms, we'll cross that bridge with him when we get there. But I don't see the sense in raising $50,000 for restrooms when we still need to connect these buildings. Put it towards the $200,000. i am asking for your support. I'm asking for your prayers. And I'm asking you to be a part of it.
And when the, when the giving starts, and the funds start coming in, so you think it's going to happen? Yep. You know why? Because I read the book. And in the book of Acts, it says that the New Testament church, who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the, of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. Now, let me explain. They did not take their homes and go sell their home and become homeless. They took homes they had that they didn't need. They took property they had they didn't need. They took possessions they had that had been sitting in warehouses or uh, let, let's make it simple. You guys got attics, you got garages, you got stuff everywhere that you haven't seen, you haven't touched it in years. And it's all because, well, it's worth something. That's how the New Testament church was in the, in the first century. So they took everything because the need was so great. They believed in the vision. They took things they didn't need and they sold it and gave it to God. I'm not saying that's what everybody should do, but I'm saying that's what I think God's going to prompt. He's putting in things in our hearts that some people are going to say, that's crazy. And I'm going to say, God's into doing crazy things. You know, when God said something he would be willing to do, he was willing to give Israel the promised land. But ten people said, that's too big. They're too big. And it cost them 40 more years of wandering in the wilderness. But two said, our God's too great not to do it. When Goliath spent 40 days cursing the people of Israel and cursing God, you had an entire army with their king saying he's too big to handle. But you had a young teenager who said, my God's too great to miss. He can't stay. I like it that God challenges us to believe him for big things. Insurmountable? Maybe in some people's minds. But it's not in mine because I'm not looking at just the overhang. I'm looking at God and what he can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to bow your heads with me. Lord, I thank you for taking our hand and walking with us. I thank you, God, that you have a revealed will that you give by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for carrying me. God, I just ask that you'll hear my heart. So for the reason of why, souls for your kingdom, effectiveness of your gospel. Lord, would you close in the overhang could you close that area in so people can love one another? Using that space to greet one another. Making space for small groups to gather. For coffee to be had. Fellowship to occur. That in sharing together in fellowship, Lord, we share the heart of God with one another with your compassion and your favor and your faithfulness. Lord, would you guide us and give us a plan? Would you bless us with the right resources and the right skills? Give us people who would commit to help make this happen for your glory. Lord, I love you. 
And I don't want anything that is outside of your will. So God, if that wasn't, if this isn't your will, then I pray. And God, you will reveal it in time. But at this point, I have to ask you, will you do it for your glory? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.